Disclaimer. It ends tonight. Or six weeks from now. Only J.K. Rowling knows. Or something. It's time. Hogwarts. It ends tonight. That message was passed from ring to ring on the hands of the members of the Order of the Phoenix all across the British Isles as the sun sank in the west before the beginning of Walpurgis Night. That was the message that Neville Longbottom carried to Dumbledore's army, telling them that Harry Potter and Hermione Granger were coming to finish the job. And that was the message that Hermione took to Kingsley with Harry, Ginny, and George, along with one additional message. We need a portkey, and we need one fast. It was possible to make a portkey solely with geographic coordinates. Indeed, for international portkeys, it was often necessary to do so. The coordinates Hermione gave Kingsley were 58 degrees, 16 minutes, and 58 seconds north latitude, 5 degrees, 7 minutes, and 20 seconds west longitude. Those weren't the coordinates of Hogwarts. The anti-portkey wards would block it. They instead landed six miles due west on a hill near a rocky shoreline facing the Hebrides. The port key would be detected, but at this point it didn't matter. She had been surprised when she calculated the location of Hogwarts to find it was much further to the northwest of Scotland than she'd expected. But in retrospect, it made sense. It was situated in Sutherland County, 2,000 square miles with only 12,000 people in it. She suspected that Hogsmeade was the largest village in the entire county, and the Muggles were totally unaware. In addition to the port key, they had recovered four brooms from Kingsley to make the flight. Since they only had to fly six miles, they would be able to get there fast and without going off course. They flew over rocky hills and small locks and streams and even a few Muggle roads as they approached. Soon, the landscape began to distort around them as they approached the edge of the unplottability ward. Using the point-me charm to find true north, they kept going even as the wards tried to turn them aside to the right or to the left until they were through into the greener land surrounding Hogwarts. There was silence for several seconds, and then they heard the distant scream of the caterwauling charm. Hermione wasn't overly worried. The Death Eaters were patrolling Hogsmeade in the forests, but they were coming up on the lake side of the castle, and they would be in before anyone got close enough to stop them. "'What do you think?' George called. "'Big entrance?' Neville wished he could say he'd made a rousing speech to Dumbledore's army before their attack. The truth was, there just wasn't time. He wasn't a superb speaker to start with, but when you had only half an hour to rally the troops and take over the castle, your speech was more or less limited to, Guys, guys, get up! Everybody up! We have to move! Harry has a mission for us! Now! He says it's time! Harry's coming here, and he needs us to take over the castle from the Death Eaters before he gets here. We're making a stand at Hogwarts! He hadn't even told them that you-know-who was already on his way, although it was implied. They had enough to worry about as it was. Now they were in control, or very near it. McGonagall, and oddly, Snape, had helped by ordering everyone to the Great Hall, where the DA could take them all down at once. It wasn't without casualties. Terry Boot was lying dead on the floor, the first death of the night, and Professor Babbling was moaning in pain as Madame Pomfrey tried to repair a dark curse that Barty Crouch Jr. had hit her with. On the other side, Imicus Caro was also dead, at the hands of Michael Corner. Electo and all of the Slytherins who had opposed them were stunned and restrained, but Barty Jr. had fled out the window, and one other had vanished and was still unaccounted for. "'Where's Snape?' Neville asked as he walked the length of the Great Hall, scanning the faces in the crowd. "'Right here, Mr. Logenbottom. Neville spun and cast a slicing hex on general principle, but Snape shielded it and several other curses thrown his way. "'Use your brain for once and desist, Longbottom,' Snape sneered. To Neville's surprise, he didn't attack, but stood there in the doorway to the entrance hall. Pro professor McGonagall!' he called. McGonagall hurried to his side, but she looked just as dumbfounded. "'Severus?' she asked. Did you really think Albus's trust was misplaced, Minerva? 
he said. Although I will confess to the indiscretion of placing a listening charm on your office. Since this will be over by dawn one way or the other, I would say my deception is no longer required. Neville's jaw dropped. What? Professor Snape is a double agent, Mr. Longbottom, McGonagall said. Dumbledore always trusted him, but... Prove it, Severus! She shouted. Excuse me, Snape said, raising an eyebrow. Dumbledore must have had some ironclad evidence from you, she said. I'm not as trusting as he was. I want you to prove it. Snape glared at her and raised his wand. Neville tensed and raised his own, but then he saw the spell Snape cast. Expecto Patronum! If you'd asked Neville, he would have thought Snape incapable of casting a Patronus. And if he were, he would have expected a bat or a snake or some other unpleasant creature. Most of the Great Hall couldn't see that far into the entrance hall from that angle, so he didn't think anyone would believe him when he told them the silver light formed into... a doe? McGonagall's eyes widened, and she lowered her wand. "'He's in the clear, Mr. Longbottom,' she said. "'And where on earth were you, Severus? You vanished for the entire fight.' Mr. Boot is dead. I merely wished to retrieve the two people in this castle who were not safe with the rest of the school, Snape said evenly. It was then that Neville heard a baby cry. The entire great hall stopped behind them. It was so rare for a baby to be in Hogwarts for any reason that it was practically unheard of. A woman stepped out of the shadows and forward into the great hall, carrying the child in her arms. She wasn't unattractive, but she was in bad shape. Her body was almost limp, with dead eyes and prematurely graying hair, and she walked forward in a daze, as if she were sleepwalking. Neville, remembering his discussions at the start of the year, understood at once. "'Bertha Jorkins!' he whispered. "'Indeed,' Snape said." who has unfortunately labored some four years under the imperious curse of Barty Crouch, Jr. Everyone just stared. I'm sorry, Neville thought. But they got everyone sorted the best they could in a few minutes. Bertha Jorkins would need professional help, but there was nothing they could do for her tonight. It was then that the front doors of the entrance hall opened, and Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, and George and Ginny Weasley stepped inside and strode forward like a royal procession. Harry, it's Harry! Hermione's here! We're safe! Ginny, you're alive! It's Fred! No, it's George! Where's the other one? The foursome made their way through the crowd with difficulty. Harry's hair was still weirdly short, so short as to be barely recognizable as his natural black. Harry, in particular, shrugged off his adoring fans with visible annoyance. Neville had noticed something even more unexpected when they stepped into the light. Ginny now had an identical lightning scar on her forehead to Harry's. What the hell was that about? But there was no time to ask, and most of the school was still preoccupied by what was on Hermione's head. Bloody hell! Is that Ravenclaw's diadem? It is, it has to be! But how? Granger has it? The four kept walking without speaking, no one willing to challenge them directly. George and Jenny waved to the crowd, but Harry didn't react, and Hermione had that same look of intense focus on her face as before, so that Neville wasn't certain she even noticed. It's good to see you back, Mr. Potter, McGonagall told him. Neville thought she might cry. Harry stepped in front of her. I just wish it were better circumstances, Professor he said. What's the situation? I'm afraid Terry Boot didn't make it, she told him matter-of-factly. Amicius Caro is dead, and the rest of the Death Eaters are restrained, save that Barty Crouch escaped. I've sent a Patronus to Hagrid. He and his brother should be within running distance. Harry nodded to her, and he ascended the dais and stood in front of the high table. He raised his hand, and the crowd quieted down at once. It was almost eerie how eager they were to hear him. Okay, listen, everyone, he called out to the crowd. He scanned the room and noticed Snape. What's he doing here? 
I will vouch for him, Mr. Potter, McGonagall said. He is on our side. Harry stared at Snape and then McGonagall for a minute before returning to his speech. All right. So, I guess first I want to thank you all for keeping up the good fight, and especially to Dumbledore's army, the DA cheered. It would have been a lot harder if we had to fight for the school. I know it's been a hard year at Hogwarts. It's been a hard year for us, too. Oh, and don't worry about the hair. It'll grow back soon, he added, pointing to his head and partly breaking the tension. I know you've all been wondering what we've been doing the past few months. The truth is, for the past year and a half, since the night Dumbledore died, in fact, we've been completing a series of tasks that he gave us to set things up to take down Unahu for good. One of those tasks was finding Ravenclaw's lost diadem. Harry motioned to Hermione here. And you have no idea how big a help it's been. We finally finished those tasks this morning. We have a plan to take him down, but he's forced our hand before we're quite ready. Harry took a deep breath and watched the eager crowd carefully. The bad news is, you know who is... He stopped and turned to Hermione. Hermione, can you undo the tongue-binding ritual? Whispers rippled through the crowd, but Hermione rolled her eyes. One ritual at a time, Harry, she said. Ugh, fine. Riddle, then. His name is Tom Morvolo Riddle. Rearrange the letters and you'll see where he got his new name. The point is, Riddle, you know who, is coming here. Tonight. Neville winced as many of his schoolmates screamed in terror, especially the younger ones. Harry raised his hands again. He'd have to act fast to keep control of the crowd. He didn't quite have Dumbledore's presence, but he could make it work in a pinch. Hey, he yelled. Riddle is coming here. He'll probably be here within the hour, and if he gets into Hogwarts, well, it'll be bad. So we're not going to let him get in. Some of the older students cheered weakly. We've called in all the fighters for the light we can, he continued. They're coming here now. Some of them are here already. He motioned to the entrance hall, where Neville was surprised to see several more Weasleys, Aberforth Dumbledore, and Hestia Jones walking into the castle. We're going to hold the castle against Riddle's army. Strange how you know who sounded so much less scary when you gave him a normal name. Harry motioned to Hermione again. Hermione has developed a powerful magic ritual that will destroy Riddle permanently, but she needs time to set it up. We have to give her that time. Hermione? Hermione stepped up beside Harry. Bethesda Babbling in the Seventh Year Ancient Runes class, step forward, she ordered. Professor Babbling staggered to her feet, and about a dozen students came forward to stand by her side. Professor, what happened to you? Hermione asked. Crouch got me, she said. Some kind of necrotizing curse. It's contained for a little while, but I need to get to St. Mungo's. Are you good to do rune work? If I have to. Hermione handed her a sheaf of parchment, and babbling paled even further as she looked through it. Miss Granger, she started. It needs to be done before sunrise, Hermione cut her off. But Hermione spoke over her, raising her voice to the crowd again. Professor Babbling and as many of her students as we can spare will carve the runes into the anchor stones. It has to be done before sunrise. That means we have to hold the castle until then. Harry took over again. We have to hold Hogwarts until sunrise. With the wards of Hogwarts, I know we can do it. I've seen what you can do, and I'm proud to serve with every one of you. We will do it. This ends tonight. On impulse, Neville stepped up and raised his wand into the air. For Hogwarts! he shouted. For, For Hogwarts! Hogwarts! the DA shouted in reply. The Order of the Phoenix arrived by a number of routes. Some came by broom through the portkey route Hermione had described. Most dropped what they were doing and apparated straight into Hogsmeade. The caterwauling charm could be heard screaming for miles, but there were so many Order members and trusted allies of Order members apparating in at once that they overwhelmed the patrols, Death Eaters, Snatchers, and Dementors alike. It didn't hurt that Voldemort was in the middle of amassing his army. A few of the Order flew by broom from there, but most took a different route. The Thestral herd had been relocated to the carriage stand in Hogsmeade to keep the students from escaping, and the Order commandeered it and drove the carriages to the school as fast as the Thestrals could pull them without shaking them apart. 
To those who could see Thestrals, sadly, many these days, it looked as if the devil himself was driving to the school at the head of a demonic procession. Ironic that these were the soldiers of the light. Harry stumbled as soon as the eyes of the crowd were no longer focused on him. Madame Pomfrey, he groaned and waved down the Medewitch. A harried-looking Madame Pomfrey came over to him. What is it now, Mr. Potter? she said. I splinched my toenails this morning, Harry told her, having a bit of trouble walking, and I'm sorry to be pushing, but just give me something that'll keep me on my feet till dawn, and then if we're still alive, you can have me. Hermione sighed. If we're still alive, I've a feeling I won't have a choice, Potter. I'll go get you something. She hurried off to her office. Hermione strode forward quickly beside McGonagall as she walked to the front of the entrance hall. The Order were gathering around them, and the Weasleys especially stayed close by. As soon as the full Order gets here, we'll have to lock down the castle and activate all of the defensive wards, she said. But what of the students? McGonagall said. We have to get them to safety. Harry shook his head. I, I don't think there's time, Professor. You know, Riddle is already on his way with his army. There's no time to evacuate the school. Even if we could open up a passage to Hogsmeade, the place will be crawling with Death Eaters soon. We can't send hundreds of kids through there in time. We'll just be handing them hostages. And if we leave them here in danger, Mr. Potter? She pressed. It's still safer than trying to get them out he said. Hermione considered the problem. It wasn't easy. She was riding the edge of a breakdown with the diadem on, and she was almost at the point of taking it off, but her intense focus on the coming battle kept her together. She thought about defending the castle and everything she knew about its layout, and a thought came to her. Professor, I have an idea, she said. We can send all the younger students down to the kitchens. The kitchens, McGonagall said in surprise. What good will that do? I've seen how the kitchens were built. They're designed to be a bunker, and they have a fully underground replica of the Great Hall. I think they were meant to double as a shelter in case of a siege. It should keep them safe from the fighting, and if Hogwarts falls, the elves can send them out through the drainage tunnels and scatter. Yeah, that's a good idea, Ron piped up. If they can't get out, that's about the best we can protect them, and they won't be in their dorms like the Death Eaters expect. McGonagall slowly nodded. Very well, I can see your logic. Anything else, then? Hermione closed her eyes, visualizing. Isolate the West Wing, she said. Ron nodded. Good point. The East Wing isn't nearly as defensible, and we're all here already anyway. Can we blow out the bridges? Hermione can, Harry said. She's loaded with C4. I'm not sure I want to know, Mr. Potter, but that won't be necessary, McGonagall said. I'm sure Mr. Finnegan would jump at the chance. And we'll help, Fred and George said in unison. Just like old times, Hermione thought. Many Order members were streaming in from the viaduct to the east wing. Hermione could see the dust from the carriages pulling up at a reckless speed around the lake to those doors. Sirius and Remus came by broom, as did Angelina, Alicia, and Katie. But what really surprised Hermione was when other Muggleborns showed up. Sally Ann, she exclaimed when her former roommate appeared. What are you doing here? Sally Ann timidly met her eyes. We're making a stand here, aren't we? She said. I can't let Lily face it alone. Oh, uh, it's good to have you then, Hermione said. Justin showed up too, and then Dean. Dirk Cresswell appeared despite his ordeal at Malfoy Manor. Others who were on the run came as well. The Folly heiress, who had also been held at Malfoy Manor, Luna and her far more reluctant father, and then... Tonks? Dora, Remus said. What are you doing here? I had to see you, Remus, she said. You think I'm going to let you come fight without me? Um, uh, yes, yes, that's exactly what I think, he told her. Tonks glared at him, and her hair flashed red. Dora, please, think of Sasha. Where is Sasha? He's with my mother. He'll be safe. Only so safe with his own mother here, Remus insisted. That's exactly why I'm here, Remus, to keep him safe. Tonks, 
Harry jumped in. She spun on him and snapped, What? Don't do this, Tonks, he said. Her hair flashed red again, but he stood his ground, though he turned to Remus. Or one of you, he said. It shouldn't be both of you here. Harry, I... Remus started. No, you shouldn't both be here, he insisted. You need to think of your son. There's been enough orphans made by this war already. Don't risk creating another one. One of you should stay home, and... Frankly, Remus is more experienced. Tonks glared at Harry. Oh, yeah? Come closer and say that to me again, Harry. I'm here to make the world safe for my son. Dora, Remus started. I'm not leaving, Remus. Harry sighed. Tonks, I'm really, really sorry about this. What do you... Eh? There was a flash of red light, and Tonks slumped into Remus's arms, revealing Ginny behind her. Remus stared at his wife, open-mouthed in shock. "'You're welcome,' Ginny said. Remus looked between her and Tonks a couple times, then nodded. "'Probably for the best,' he admitted. "'Can you get her out of here?' "'No, but we can put her with the younger students,' Hermione said. She waved down McGonagall to hand her off. Molly was the next to arrive, and Hermione was worried she would lead to even more drama, but she greeted her anyway. "'Molly, you came!' "'Well, I'm certainly not going to let my family join this madness without me, dear,' Molly said fiercely. "'Flor didn't come, did she?' "'Of course not, Hermione. And, Ginny, you shouldn't be here either. It's too dangerous.' Ginny whirled on her mother. "'Mum, if you're going to try to stop me, this is not the time.' Hermione reached up to touch Molly's shoulder. "'It's too late to evacuate anyway, Molly,' she said. The younger students will be hiding in the kitchen, but Ginny should go with them, Molly said. Where Harry goes, I go, Mum, Ginny snapped. It was then that Molly noticed the scar on Ginny's forehead. Ginny, she said worriedly, what happened to you, your head? Hermione sighed. That was sort of my fault, Molly. You see, the connection between Harry and you know who. Harry laid a hand on her shoulder. We'll tell her, Hermione, he said. Hermione turned to him. What? Are you sure? Yeah, he said. It had to happen. Sooner or later, Ginny finished for him. Come on, Mum. We have a lot to tell you. It's quite the thrilling tale. Molly's eyes grew wider and wider as she saw Harry and Ginny flawlessly copy George and Fred's twin-speak routine. But Hermione wondered how long they'd been practicing that. They weren't that good yet. I, I, Molly stammered. Come on, Mum, Ginny said. She and Harry led her away, leaving Hermione and the rest of the order to focus on securing the school. Among the last to arrive were Colin and Dennis Creevy, and a small blonde figure jumped down from Colin's back. Sonia, Hermione exclaimed. How have you been? Then she slapped her head. Oh, I'm being dumb. Dobby! Pop! "'Miss Hermione! Sonia!' he gasped. He ran to her and kissed her, much to the surprise of the Order, who were not at all accustomed to such a public display from house elves. Even McGonagall raised her eyebrows. "'Well, there's something you don't see every day,' Sirius said. "'I left Creature at the safe house. He's got better, but I don't trust him quite that much. Besides, someone has to take care of Hedwig.' "'Oh, Hedwig!' Hermione exclaimed. "'I'd completely forgotten about her.' Harry hardly ever mentions her. She's been with you? Yeah, ever since Harry got run out of Hogwarts the second time. And let me tell you, she is not happy about being kept indoors, but a snowy owl is just too conspicuous. That made sense, she thought. Dobby, we're making a stand at Hogwarts tonight, she told the elf when he was done greeting his... girlfriend, she supposed. I'd like you to help the Hogwarts elves with whatever they're doing. Sonia, you should probably do that, too. "'Professor McGonagall, what will the elves be doing?' she questioned. "'I will take care of that, Miss Granger,' McGonagall said. "'Tilly! Pop! You called Professor McGonagall, ma'am?' the grey-haired elf said when she appeared before them. But Hermione noticed her attire had changed. She was wearing a more ornate tea towel than before. The uniform of the head elf. "'Tilly!' Hermione said in surprise. "'Grandmum!' 
Sonia squeaked. Tilly saw her and bowed. Hello, Miss Hermione, Sonnet, she said. Tilly, he who... Lord Voldemort is preparing to attack Hogwarts as we speak, McGonagall said. Tilly squeaked in fear, but she stood her ground. The younger students will be taking supper in the kitchens and spending the night there for safety's sake. For the rest of the school, please send up some platters of sandwiches so we may keep up our strength as we defend the castle. Oh, and take Mrs. Lupin to the kitchens with you. And Miss Jorkins and her child, I suppose. Yes, Professor McGonagall! Tilly saluted and vanished with Tonks with a pop. Tilly's the head elf now? Hermione asked. McGonagall nodded. Sadly, Flory died last autumn. At her age, she could not handle the stress. Professor Sprout made Tilly head elf as she was one of the few elves with a constitution to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Death Eaters. Hermione smiled a bit. Yes, I know where Sonya gets it, she said. Indeed. Ah, uh, and I am sorry to have to inform you that Winky is also dead. Winky? Hermione gasped. How? Barty Crouch murdered her early last autumn. There wasn't anything we could do. I suspect he didn't want her revealing any secrets or working against him. Hermione felt a pang in her chest. After all Winky had been through, to meet such an ignominious end at the hands of her former master. It was sickening, but she couldn't dwell on it now. And soon enough she was distracted by another unexpected arrival, a tall black-haired witch in burgundy robes. Septima, she gasped. Hermione, Septima smiled. Hermione ran to hug her former teacher. Septima, what on earth are you doing here? she asked. Just because I can't do arithmancy any more doesn't mean I can't fight, she responded. If this is it, I couldn't let you face it without helping you, all of you. It's good to see you, Septima, McGonagall said, clasping her arm. Septima nodded in return and soon joined the others. Kingsley was the last one through the doors. He surveyed the assembled order and then approached McGonagall. I think that's everyone, Minerva, he said. At least, no one else came to me for a portkey. Just a moment, Kingsley, McGonagall said. We're still waiting for two more. Oi, you don't go startin' the party without us, did you? Party! Hagrid! Hermione squealed. She ran to hug her half-giant friend as he trudged into the entrance hall. Grop was right behind him, having to stoop to get through even the huge doors of Hogwarts. His strength would be a great advantage, especially if you knew who had giants of his own. "'Good to see you, Hermione,' Hagrid said. "'And, Harry, is that you?' he noticed his hair. "'Oh, right, reporting for duty, Professor McGonagall.' "'Excellent,' McGonagall said. "'That's everyone.' "'Professors of Hogwarts,' she called. "'Now is the time. We must protect the school.' She and most of the other teachers moved into the courtyard and pointed their wands at the sky. "'Protego Maxima, Fontio Duri, Repello Inimicum, Protego Horribilis, Salvio Hexia, Cave Inimicum, Protego Totalum.' A dome of light began to form over the castle as they chanted like a shield charm, but on a scale Hermione had never imagined it before. She wasn't entirely sure what she was seeing. A ward so powerful couldn't come from wands alone. It had to be from the main wards of Hogwarts. Yet the teachers were activating it and probably tweaking it somehow with their spells, presumably adjusting it for the current situation. The dome came down and touched to the ground around the castle with a force that shook the stones. But Professor McGonagall wasn't done. She turned around and faced the entrance where she encanted, Per totem locomotor. There was a sound of grinding stone, and then a loud crash as the stone statues that lined the battlements sprang to life and jumped down to the courtyard below. Echoing crashes reached her ears from the furthest reaches of the castle, and Hermione jumped and backed up to get out of their way. There were dozens of statues marching forward, each larger than life, at nearly eight feet tall. "'Hogwarts is threatened!' shouted Professor McGonagall. "'Man the boundaries! Protect us! Do your duty to our school!' She turned to Hermione, looking like she was on the verge of giggling. 
I've always wanted to use that spell, she said. Hermione laughed. She dodged between the statues as she followed McGonagall back inside. In the entrance hall, there were yet more statues, suits of armor marching down from the grand staircase and the corridors throughout the school. They returned to the great hall, where McGonagall addressed the students, trying to reassure them. Many of them were shivering, some crying in fear, and it would only get worse before the night was over. "'There is not time to evacuate the castle,' Hermione said. "'The underage students and Slytherin House will take refuge in the kitchens. "'They are one of the most defensible parts of the castle, "'and the house elves will be able to supply provisions there.' "'Hermione looked around and spotted the Slytherin members of the D.A., "'who were shifting their feet nervously. "'Professor,' she spoke up, "'it wasn't all of Slytherin that opposed us, was it? "'They deserve a chance to fight, too.' McGonagall turned to face her. "'I admire your fair-mindedness, Miss Granger, but Slytherin House has been the Death Eater's recruiting arm for this entire year. We cannot take the risk of traitors in our midst. We cannot take the risk of... We cannot take the risk of traitors in our midst. "'I'll vouch for Daphne and Tracy personally, ma'am,' she insisted. "'Oh, and Blaze, too, I suppose.' "'And me!' Astoria Greengrass piped up. "'Me, too!' called Georgina. Astoria, you need to get out of here, Daphne said. No way, I'm defending my sister. You're not in any state to fight. Hermione jumped in before they could make a scene. She's right, Astoria. We can take Slytherins, but we need to make sure the people fighting won't be a liability. Daphne laid her hands on her sister's shoulders. What Granger said, Tori. Besides, you'll be one of the oldest members of the DA in the kitchens, we need you to help keep the younger kids from panicking. Astoria looked up into Daphne's eyes, then conceded and lowered her head, apparently accepting having some important job. Septima would ensure Georgina went with her. Daphne, Tracy, can you vouch for any other Slytherins you trust? Hermione asked. They nodded their agreement. Better check him for the dock mock just in case, Ron said. Hermione rolled her eyes, but it was a fair point. Neville, Daphne, Anthony, and Susan, can you vouch for any students who are competent enough to be more of an asset than a risk in a real fight? She went on. Miss Granger, McGonagall snapped, we should not be allowing any underage students to fight. With all due respect, I think we're past that point, ma'am. She's right, Professor, Neville agreed. Anyone who truly wants you know who... Riddle, gone, and can fight? Now is the time. A loud cheer went up from the crowd, and McGonagall was forced to admit. Very well. Prefects, do a head count and ensure no one is missing. Fifth year prefects, escort your houses to the kitchens. Once that was sorted, Hermione drew a deep breath and took the diadem off her head. Hogwarts would be protected. About as well as it could be, in fact. Now it just remained to hold out long enough to complete the ritual. Hermione, can I talk to you? George said. Yes, George? George pulled her away to the antechamber off the entrance hall, where the first years always waited before the sorting, and he took a deep breath. Hermione, there's something I really need to say since this is, you know, coming to a head tonight. Hermione held up her hand to cut him off. George, is this really the time? Um, did you not hear what I just said? I don't want you to say anything that you wouldn't say if we weren't at a serious risk that we'll both be dead by morning, she insisted. Well, too bad, cause I'm saying it anyway. Marry me. Hermione stopped dead. What? what, what? Marry me, he repeated. And I would have said it anyway. Probably not this soon, but I definitely would have said it. I've been thinking about it for a while now. He reached into his robes and pulled out a ring, and Hermione squeaked in shock. It was an antique-looking ring with interlocking yellow and white gold bands and a diamond and a ruby set into it. You see, Mum gave me this right before we officially moved into the factory with you, George said. It was her Mum's wedding ring, and she wanted me to have it. For you. Hermione's mind was a blur. Molly was in on this? And was this really the bloody time? 
So I can get down on one knee and make a sappy drawn-out speech if you really want, George pressed on. But the important thing is that I love you, Hermione. I want to spend the rest of my life with you, and I don't want to go into this fight without making it official. He held out the ring to her. Hermione was still frozen. Her mouth hung open, but no sound came out of it. Hermione? George said, worriedly. He waved his hand in front of her face when she still didn't speak. Hermione, please say something. Yes, of course I'll marry you, George. The words tumbled out of her mouth as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. She half snatched the ring from his hands as she helped him put it on her finger. Surprisingly, it fit snug enough. Before she could speak again, he swept her up in his arms and kissed her hard. She put her arms around him, almost allowing herself to get lost in the kiss. Almost. She pulled away from him a bit. I'm keeping my maiden name, she said. It's too confusing building up a scholarly reputation when you suddenly have to change your name on all your papers. George laughed and gave her another quick peck on the lips. Whatever you want, Hermione, he said. Suddenly, there was the loud thud of an impact overhead and a rumbling in the foundations of the castle. They both looked up and then back at each other. But we really have to get moving, she said. They ran back to the great hall, where the order and the defending students were reassembling, the younger students already down in the kitchens. The enchanted ceiling gave enough of a view of outside to see what was happening. From the north side of the castle, literally hundreds of curses slammed into the shield surrounding the castle, leaving flashes of light where they impacted, and the rumbling grew continuous as the bombardment ramped up. To the battlements! McGonagall shouted. The defenders scrambled up to the top of the west wing, making good time. Hermione figured on the bridges breaking them down as they climbed, leaving the west wing as a very defensible keep, or it was when it was built before the invention of the broomstick, but it was the best they could do. When they finally reached the battlements, the bombardment was still continuing. "'How long will the wards hold?' she asked McGonagall. "'If we're lucky, long enough,' was the answer. Hermione stared out grimly through the battered shield. She managed to make out the vague outline of a massed force, hundreds strong, standing at the edge of the Forbidden Forest. She then looked around the battlements and took in the absurdity of her situation. Eighteen years old, and already engaged, on the most dangerous night of her life, trapped in a castle that was being hammered by an army of dark wizards like an entire artillery brigade, waiting for a wounded teacher to finish carving the runes that were their only chance of winning. Engaged. She grinned and gripped her wand tighter in her hand. To hell with this! I'm gonna live! 